What's going on here? Grown men having their trousers ripped off? And people ripping up bits of cloth in time to the picture? Involving the audience in a silent movie, I, I think, gets it back where it should be, which is in the theatre. The point about silent film is that it is a live medium. This world of silent cinema was lost to us from the moment sound took over, but we're going to rediscover it tonight through the comedy of Laurel and Hardy. Most of us recognise Laurel and Hardy as those inept individuals who hauled a piano up a flight of stairs, danced as cowboys and always found themselves in situations where they were permanently accident prone. Well, those films I just mentioned were made with sound and dialogue and we're familiar with those. Laurel and Hardy made over 100 films but their first 33 films were silent, over a third. Films like the wonderful, trouserless, Your Darn Tootin. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr Stan Laurel and Mr Oliver Hardy. <laughs> Some people have difficulty telling them apart, which one's Laurel, which one's Hardy. Even Laurel and Hardy at times couldn't tell each other apart. The truth is that Stan is the thin one. He's also a writer and director, so he's much brainier than his on-screen appearance would suggest. And Ollie's the other one, a brilliant character actor, but who's more than content to let Stan be the creative brains behind the team. But before they teamed up, they both had solo careers. Stan Laurel, originally from Ulverston in Lancashire, had come from a music hall background and in 1912 toured America with the Fred Carno troupe as an understudy to Charlie Chaplin. Here's Stan in one of his last solo appearances, a comic parody of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde. Oliver Hardy began his film career as a character actor. This is him playing a villainous thug in the film No Man's Law. Ollie's off-screen nickname became Babe and he played a wide range of bizarre roles, including the Tin Man in a strange rendition of The Wizard of Oz. You've got Stan and you've got Ollie. Both actors of quite different talents, but they complement each other beautifully. The result, the result is the double, is the act. double act. I thought I was going to say that. I thought I was going to say that. Well, that's it, I'm leaving. Well, I'm going as well then. Wait for me, I, I didn't mean it. I'm just... <laughs> I've been travelling around the country sharing my enthusiasm for this unique double act. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming along to Paul Merton's uh, Silent Clowns. Today is Laurel and Hardy. Um, lots of people don't know that Laurel and Hardy made silent films, or indeed Laurel and Hoodie, which was a, a double act that only lasted for a couple of movies. Um, the first film they appeared in together as a team was called Duck Soup. They both worked at the Howard Roach Studios at the time. Uh, Ollie was an actor. Stan was uh, more of a sort of director writer. He had been an actor for a long time, as I mentioned, and uh, he wasn't that keen on joining a double act. Here, they play two tramps in danger of being rounded up by the local park rangers to help fight forest fires. Now, it's, 
It's one of the more unusual plot lines, vagrants hired to fight forest fires. Um, where that idea came from, it, I have really no idea. Um, so that's the very first, Laurel, as we think of them, as Laurel and Hardy. You can see that the differences there are obvious. This film had disappeared. We, hadn't, this, we thought it was lost up to the 1970s, and they rediscovered a, a, uh, a sample of it in Belgium, and a bit in, Fu in uh, I nearly said Fulham, in France. Um, <laughs> Fulham in France, by the way, it's a little area of France that you wouldn't know about. Um, Le Fulham, they call it, the French. Um, I don't know why, because it doesn't exist. Films like this capture some of the early Laurel and Hardy comedy traits so beautifully that I was keen to hear what a contemporary comedian and actor might make of these early works. Seeing some of those early ones kind of makes you go, wait, wait a minute. But they also then hadn't quite established the kind of the bowler-hatted mm. uh, um, characters that we know. And they, they kind of played with, with this relationship. And I think that's the interesting thing to me about the silent films, is you can see that coming together, yes, you know, yeah. you've got these odd films uh, like uh, The Flying Elephants, yes. uh, which, <laughs> which is set in the Stone Age. And you've got elements of, you know, in, even in that one, in uh, Flying Elephants, for those people who don't know, thus called because in one very, very brief moment, they have animated elephants going across the sky, but that's yeah. it. It's that weird thing of it's t it's comedy Stone Age. It's yes, not, yeah. It's not you know Stone Age uh, in any time terms of reality. It's not walking with dinosaurs, is it? Yeah, or Quest for Fire <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> The next few films they made, another half a dozen films, they don't really, they appear in them, but they often they don't have scenes together or they're playing characters that we're not familiar with. And let's have a look now at their, uh, their seventh film called The Second Hundred Years. And this is often considered the first official Laurel and Hardy film. And, and in this film, we begin to see um, the screen characters that we know and remember from the talkies. <laughs> The Second Hundred Years proved to be a very important film in the evolution of Stan and Ollie when it came to the visualisation of their characters. They both shaved their heads for that part, to play convicts, and when, when Stan's hair grew back, it grew back in that rather unruly sort of way, and they kept it for the rest of his movie. So it came from the fact that he shaved his head for this film. So the thing that Stan does with his hair by pushing up the front almost creates a, a, a new character, a new look. I'll show you what I mean. So it's just it kind of... With Ollie, it's not about hair, it's about a look into the camera. That's where he gets a lot of his laughs. And, and the more he looks into that camera, the more we share his sense of exasperation. He just has to go... And we know how he feels. <laughs> They really did push the boundaries back in terms of breaking that fourth wall, in Ooh. terms of <sighs> using the camera. Yes. You know, and suddenly we're seeing these two guys who separately can relate to us. Mm. And that makes us absolutely involved. It means mm. we're there with them. And I think that's why they've kind of lasted. One of the other distinct features of a Lauren Hardy film might be the association with this music. 
It's the Cuckoo Song, written by Marvin Hatley. I made this little silly tune as a radio time signal to count the hours. And Stan Laurel came up and heard it and says, that tune's for me, that's just what I want. That little cuckoo part's just what I like, see there. So he says, I'd like to use that for my theme. I says, well, swell. So then I showed him how it was put together. This represents Stan Laurel. It's supposed to be cuckoo. Same thing over, not very bright. He's dull, he's stupid, see. That's what that means, stupid. And the big one, Babe, is very dominating, see. Arrogant, he's the boss. Like a bugle call in the army, see. So he put them together. Cuckoo's song became Stan and Ollie's signature tune and accompanied their talk in pictures. But I'm interested in what might have accompanied their films from the silent era. And I've been working with composer Neil Brand, who I've asked to score this 1928 Laurel and Hardy short, You're Darn Tootin'. <laughs> Looking at it now, Neil, your initial thoughts, what do you think the... Uh, the musical makeup of this film will be the score, you know, the score that you'll come up with. Well, it's going to be a small ensemble. We know that mm -hmm. it's going to probably no more than ten. Mm -hmm. But there's certain instruments we've obviously got to have. The fact that Stan is a clarinet player and Ollie's a horn player, we've got mm -hmm. to have clarinet and horn. Yeah. And I had, I had a thought on the title, sort of theme music. James Bernard, who scored most of the Hammer horror films, mm -hmm. used to get his main title themes from the title of the film. Mm -hmm. So Dracula was dum ba dum and Taste the Blood of Dracula was da 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 ba da mm. And with this I just thought, well, you're darn tootin' da 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 pa mm. sounds like the phrase. Mm. But it doesn't actually go anywhere. Yes. So it's sort of, you know, da 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 pa dee 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 whatever. Mm. And then mm. just repeating that. Yes. That sounds really, that immediately sounds quite breezy, quite twenty. Very, yeah. 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 <laughs> but I think that da 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 bum, it's, yeah. it immediately gives you some speed. Yes. It means we can come away from that sort of speed when we get into the house with yeah. the two of them behind yeah. the table. But then we can come back with a vengeance. So it's about contrast, it's about variety. Yeah, and I mean, it is very much about keeping up. I mean, mm. I think that's the thing. That they're setting my tempos, not just with his foot going there, yeah. but they're setting my tempos all the way through. Yeah, you have to, you really are, you're serving the film in the best possible way you can. If at all possible, yeah. yeah. I mean, as long as the audience think the music's coming out the screen yeah. with the film, then, yeah, yeah then, then we've yeah. got a job. Well, no, I, 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 well I, you know, I, I, look forward to, I look forward to hearing it. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> Neil's skill is not only in the writing of new material, it's also about being able to improvise at live screenings as the original silent musicians would have done. In the film Leave Em Laughing, the gag is that Stan and Ollie have inhaled too much laughing gas whilst on a visit to the dentist. The musical challenge here is to carry the mood of a particular situation without dominating the silent comedy itself. In the early days of silent cinema, films were often accompanied very much in the style seen here, with just one man and a piano. I think by the time certainly you get to the mid-twenties, it's very unusual to just have a single piano player in the movie theatre. It's much more likely that you'd have had at least two or three musicians in the pit. Your piano player can do a certain amount, but a piano player and a percussionist can do a tremendous amount. A piano player and a violinist and percussionist can do as much again. The violin is giving you so much more in the way of melodic sense, some of that sort of feel. And three, and sometimes even four, and if they've been working together a long time, five musicians can almost improvise together. So you have this wonderful sense of a kind of creative stew going on in the pit of a movie house. When you get any larger than that in terms of movie bands, and certainly the main cinemas in most of the towns had very large bands, I mean 20 or upwards, there you're really talking about a kind of an opera setup in which the musical director has to plan out for his entire band to not only play exactly the right music through the film, but also to do musical interludes. And quite often under those circumstances, the piano player would be left to play a short on his own. 
So, in the days of uh, silent films, uh, every film, of course, would have some sort of accompaniment, whether it'd be something that Leicester Square owed in a 60-piece orchestra or, 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 a, or a piano in a, in a sort of small village hall somewhere. Mm. Um, the musicians of the, of the year, uh, would, did they have a source book? Was there a sort of place they could go to for, to pick up various themes that they might see up on the screen? By the time we get from about 1915 onwards, the film companies would begin to produce cue sheets, for instance. When a film came out, they'd send this sheet out to everywhere the film was playing. And, and this just, is a, they'd just be for the big features? The, yeah, that's yeah. right. There'd be a list of titles and suggested music to play with those. Or there was something like this, which is the sort of silent film pianist's Bible. This is Erno Rappe's motion picture movement. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's there. It's actually set up so that a pianist who's playing for one piece of film, for instance, if they could actually play a film at sight with this, uh -huh. you've got the A to Z index down here. Oh yes, aeroplane, band, battle birds, all the way down to railroad, to sadness, sea storm, sinister, wedding, and western. That's <laughs> okay. So you're, whatever comes up next, you know. Oh my yes. God, there's if a, there's a fire, sinister wedding and western, you've <laughs> sorted out here straight away, aren't you? Um, so um, do we? Can we go to uh, uh, sinister, perhaps? Sinister. Yeah, this is nice sort of mood stuff. This is something going from the Coriolan Overture by Beethoven. Oh, okay. So, um. You get I, the idea? Yeah, I'm envisaging a, a, a ship on a wind-tossed sea there for some reason. I've got some, some, some sails there. Um, hey, it's lovely. But a wind-tossed sea isn't quite what we need for one of the more delicate performances from Stan and Ollie. In the film Their Purple Moment, the boys are out on the town and running up a huge tab, but Stan has just discovered his wallet is full of fake money. Even a taxi driver has got fed up of waiting outside and has come to the restaurant demanding to be paid. For me, their purple moment is an iconic example of the way Stan and Ollie played off each other to create such a long-lasting comedy partnership. Oh, really? Where's that? I visited an iron foundry to see the casting of a new statue celebrating this special relationship. And I took along comedian Andre Vincent to find out why he thinks the duo are so admired today. And I suppose as well as about Lauren Hardy, it's very difficult to say which one is the funny one and which one is the straight one because they are they are both That's it, it's sort of it sort of swaps, isn't it? It's like this seesaw. Yeah. One person goes up being stupid yeah. while the other one's being clever or being funny, being straight. And then it, it's that it's the most beautiful sort of like passing mm. passing the joke, passing the fun. Mm. So many sort of like straight out and double act, you know, you've got the straight person, you've got the funny person. And, and with them, it was never that. It was, mm. it was mm. we don't care. And I think it's, it's, it's the ability of Ollie. I mean, he's such a great actor. He's such a wonderful actor. That gives Stan so much to bounce off. Yeah. That he becomes, instead of being a proactive comic, he becomes a reactive comic, as it were. Yeah, yeah. I suppose it's that sort of, yeah, the negative sort of makes positive. Does that make yes. Two negatives make a positive. Yeah, it, if that's correct. It, if that's I correct. Believe, I think that's right from science. Is it right from science? <laughs> I don't know much about science. <laughs> Death. Physicality was incredible. 
that, that they could just, it was, you know, just a little facial look and you knew what they were saying. Yeah. So you knew if there was a problem in the house because it was just... Yes. And that was it. Yes. You knew that there was something he, he had to go over there. Mm. And now for a little adventure. I'm off to the biggest silent film festival in the world. Here we are in Italy, that's Italy outside, and I'm here to visit the Ligionato da Cinema Muto Film Festival. That's a silent film festival. And here they're going to be screening the Laurel and Hardy film Your Darn Tootin' and playing the newly composed score by Neil Brand. This is going to be its European premiere. I apologise for my pronunciation earlier, by the way. I, Last time I ordered food in a foreign restaurant, I ended up with a plate of well done earmuffs. Neil's already in Italy, having now completed his score, but it's a nerve wracking time. The thing about your darn tootin' is it's a musical story, so it requires very precise synchronisation between the instruments and the picture. I'll beat you in again, oh, so I'll give you the beat beforehand. Good. Ready, one before E. And one. Neil is anxious to rehearse the newly arrived musicians. Hold it, and then now in for G. Two, three, four. Playing for Laurel and Hardy is like getting to play with um, Spike Jones and the City Slickers, you know, it's just kind of like pow and everything goes everywhere and you have to try and stop the band with pistol shots. It looks easy enough, but Neil will only have two rehearsals. The first to acquaint the musicians with the score, and the second to rehearse the music to the picture. My first feeling was actually I was terrified of it. Because a film that is so much about music, the music has to be so spot on to make it work. Um, there's an element of certainly improvised piano whereby you can never make a mistake because there's no written music. You can never play a wrong note. If I play a note I didn't intend to play, I go back and play it again so that people think it was intended all along. With something like Your Darn Tooting, the precision in there, I must have sat and watched that film four or five times and just thought, how on earth can I make that work? And all it comes down to at the end of the day is well, if all you've got is a man standing up going, Duh, what else do you do? You know, it's in the screen. Just use what's in the screen. But there's such a sense of anarchy about those bandstand scenes that when Laurel and Hardy come back home and are just sitting in their digs about to have dinner, it's got to be as relaxed as it can be so that, you know, it, it's, there's almost nothing in the music saying, this is funny. That means that the moments then of high comedy, which happen straight away with the salt and the pepper and the, the sauce, I, am, I don't mark those at all, hardly. And they're that much funnier for it. Because if I was trying to make the music go, oh, oh, oh that's a funny bit, isn't it? Then the audience you know, would be turning off all the time because they'd be going, well, the music was too insistent. For the music just to relax back, and sort of hang out with them for that scene was uh, a nice kind of dip in the middle of the film because then we can build back up to the sort of uproarious ending of that film. And now the actual afternoon of the performance and I can't wait to hear the finished thing. Neil 
always given the score a little interactive element which needs an explanation from me to the international audience. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you who aren't Italian speakers, let me explain to you what this piece of cloth is for. Um, in this score, beautifully composed by Neil Brand and beautifully played, as you're about to hear, there is a sequence towards the end where trousers are ripped off. Um, at the point that you see trousers ripped off, this is your opportunity to perform in a Lauren Hardy film by ripping the cloth that you have here. A piece of advice, there are more trousers ripped than you could imagine. So don't rip the cloth everybody at the first go, because otherwise there'll be no cloth ripped at the end. Impress your neighbours by how late you rip the cloth. <laughs> Without any further ado, I leave you in the very capable hands of Mr Neil Brand, his lovely orchestra, and Mr Laurel and Mr Hardy. Thank you. about silent film is that it is a live medium. So to have an audience actually sitting there holding their bit of paper or their bit of cloth waiting for that moment when the trousers go and this sense of delight because it, it meant it got two laughs. There was the laugh of seeing the trousers ripped, there was the laugh of doing your own rip. So there was a kind of, it was like almost if the audience was given a license to play. The great thing about the trouser ripping scene is just how many people Stan and Ollie managed to involve. And what's clever about a scene like this is how quickly the situation spirals out of control. Laurel and Hardy use crowds almost as a comedy prop. At first a few people witness the mayhem and then others are sucked into the mountain chaos. <laughs> These were very slapstick based routines, almost childlike in their humour, but the range of situations that Stan and Ollie put themselves in was actually quite diverse. We never question the number of scenes where, as two grown men, they share a bed. They're just mates who are trying to solve some bizarre problem. And then, in the same situation, they'll slip in an adult gag. <laughs> I just think it's such a wonderful gesture. It just tells you everything about that joke. He walks past and just says something with his hat, like, you know, it just... If you don't get the joke, I can't explain it to you, but it's all... Uh... <laughs> Of course, they weren't just a double act, Lauren Hardy. You, you have an advantage when you're in a double act. You have immediately somebody to play with and play against, and it, it's, it's easier, in a certain sense, to come up with more material because there's two of you to play with. But of course, they also had a, a great supporting cast. Uh, perhaps most preeminent amongst them all was James Finlinson, who was, uh, as the name suggests, was Scottish. Um, at one point in earlier in their career, the three of them were billed as a trio. Stan, Oliver, I think it was Oliver Hardy, Stan Lowell, James Finlinson was how they billed it. This film here, we've got quite a lengthy extract from this one because this is one of the all-time great comedies that Lauren Hardy, or indeed anybody, ever made. Um, it's a film called Big Business. The plot involves Stan and Ollie as Christmas tree salesmen doing very little business in sunny California. James Finlinson is their unwilling customer who has neither ordered nor wants to buy a Christmas tree.
the same goal in mind. I mean, this is the obvious thing about a team, they want the same thing. At no point do they question that things are getting more and more out of control. If anything, they negotiate with each other how to step it up to the next point. That collusion, all the way through big business, gets larger and larger and larger until they don't need to negotiate anymore. <laughs> this kind of comic payback Laurel and Hardy routine was invented by the director Leo McCary, who directed many of their early films, and this particular type of humour became known as tit for tat. There's a dispute between two people. I'm having an argument with you. I cut off your tie. This person just stands there, lets the tie be cut off, doesn't retaliate in any way, knowing that it's his turn, sooner or later, to pour a bucket of whitewash down the trousers or whatever. And the person just stands there and lets them do it. Reciprocal destruction, I think it's called. And I believe that's how the nuclear policy has worked over the last 60 years. <laughs> By 1930, after just four years of working together, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy had hit the big time on both sides of the Atlantic. But like the other major silent comedy stars of their era, Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton and Harold Lloyd, Stan and Ollie would have had to face the huge challenge of giving their characters a voice with a crossover into sound pictures. Why don't you keep your mouth shut? What did I do? Yes, what you did, you put us right on the spot. There was a kind of surprise, I think, when they first spoke, because, uh, again, uh, you know, with silent films, people always projected, as you do with people that you've, whose vo voice you've only heard, mm. and then you mm. see them. I've never, you know... Yes, the, the they never match up. Ella Fitzgerald, for me, yeah. was always physically a disappointment. Yes, Because you... I, I imagined this kind of incredible sumptuous woman and she was amazing but she looked like somebody's auntie one of mine yeah oh really and that was and that was really <laughs> off putting <laughs> except my actual auntie had a kind of rasping kind of like 60 a day voice yes and in the same way it was unexpected that you'd have this kind of uh, quite from this big guy this kind of uh, quite sweet mm. sensitive wonderful singing voice mm. and then you had from this kind of skinny guy uh, this kind of odd sort of transatlantic accent. Mm. In the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, on the trail of the lonesome pine, in the pale moonshine, a heart's entwine, where she carved her name and I carved mine. Or June, or June just like, like the mountains of blue, like the pine. I am lonesome for you. Having discovered their voices, they embraced the new art form of the talkies with relish. In the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, on the trail of the lonesome pine, in the pale moonshine, our hearts entwine, where she carved her name and I carved mine, oh June, like the mountains I'm blue, like the pine. 
I am lonesome for you. In the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, on the trail of the lonesome pine. They were fully formed by the time sound came along. And by fully formed, I mean that the way they took the world, this kind of lugubrious blundering through a fog together, very naturally had a voice. As soon as you have a team, they've got to talk to each other. And off it goes. I can't make it. Don't weaken now. We've only got a couple more steps. Now both together. Heave ho! I think one of the main reasons for Stan and Ollie's success was the fact that when they spoke, their characters didn't change. Stan was the piping voiced fool, and Ollie had the big polite southern twang that went with the big polite southern man. Oh. <clears throat> Just a minute, my friend Mr. Hardy will speak to you. Hello. Uh, excuse me, please, my ear is full of milk. They were the most successful of the silent clowns who crossed over to sound. Brush that off. But now I'm going to take you back to the heyday of silent cinema. The orchestra is gathered in the pit and the projector's ready to roll. So let's have a look at Lolan Hardy and your darn tootin with its brand new musical score.
The superb Laurel and Hardy. Thank you all very much for coming. This has been Paul Merton, Silent Clowns. Until the next time, goodbye. So our verdict on this is that it's a, it's a yeah, pretty good job, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. For statues of comedians, mm. which there are so many of these days, yeah. uh, it's going to be a good one. Mm. Good. Okay. I'm happy with that. Yep. Okay, let's go.